In this video, we're going to look at a projectile motion problem with a horizontal launch. I'm going to be sharing a few things that work for any projectile motion problem, but this time we're looking specifically at a projectile launched horizontally or just to the right. Here's a problem. A student fires a cannonball horizontally with a speed of 31 meters per second from a height of 80 meters. And so we've got uh, a student standing on the top of some building. I don't know why, it's kind of kind of weird, but and they're launching a projectile out of a cannon from the top of that building. And it's gonna land somewhere down here and we wanna know several questions, including at the end, how long did the cannonball remain in the air? And then two, how far did it go? How far is it from the base of this building whenever it lands? The first thing we're gonna do anytime we're encountering a projectile motion problem is we're gonna split up the problem into vertical and horizontal and we're going to analyze them completely separately of each other in fact i'm drawing a line down the middle of my middle of the section of my screen here just to keep everything separate i'm going to even use different colors i'm going to use blue for vertical red for horizontal to keep things straight that's the easiest mistake that students can make in solving this type of problem it's just to mix those components up so the first thing i want to do is write out um, the variables i'm going to need to know um, kind of from the start of the problem and those variables are acceleration initial velocity and initial position for vertical I'm going to use y for my initial position um, just a lot of times we use y like the y-axis in math and then for horizontal I'm going to use x and so I've got x initial for my initial horizontal position there and so these are the three variables that I always start with um, and I go ahead and write them out even before I kind of get involved in the problem all right let's reread the problem and see what information we know to start off with a student fires a cannonball horizontally, that means I'm looking at the horizontal or side-to-side -side motion, with a speed of 31 meters per second. Now when it says it's launched horizontally, that means that there's no initial vertical motion. If you look at the cannon here, notice it's pointed to the side, it's not pointed kind of up and to the right, it's not pointed down and to the right, it's just pointed um, exactly horizontal. And so that tells me a few things. It tells me that the vertical initial velocity is zero meters per second. It's not moving up or down at the beginning. Now, after any time has passed, it's going to be falling and it'll have a downward vertical velocity. But the very beginning, when it's not moving up or down yet, the instant it leaves the cannon, zero meters per second vertical. And again, that's because the cannon's pointed horizontally. That means that 31 meters per second, that whole speed is horizontal. So my initial horizontal velocity is 31 meters per second. And I use a positive there to indicate to the right. And so we know the answer to these first couple questions, the cannonball's initial horizontal speed and its initial vertical speed. All right, let's read the rest of that sentence. From a height of 80 meters. All right, the height, we're talking about vertical there. And so it's launched from that height. So that's going to be our initial um, vertical position or initial height. So I'm going to label a few things on my diagram here. Um, that means this distance is 80 meters. And that means that I'm going to define this, you know, this bottom, the floor, the ground as y equals zero. And I'm going to define, define the, the top here of the building as y equals 80 meters. And that's the height that he's launching from. All right. Um, and I'll label that in my variables right here. Um, one thing you notice, I labeled it to the top of the, the building there, but really I guess it should be to the top of um, kind of the middle of the cannon there. That's, that's where that 80 meters actually kind of goes up to. So I mislabeled it a little bit there. Um, the next thing is we're looking at the horizontal um, position here. And so in this case, we don't, it's not, it doesn't tell us any horizontal positions, um, but it kind of makes sense to define the edge of the building here as x equals zero, because we want to know how far did it go. Let's just define this as zero, and we can solve for this distance over there, that position. So we don't know that distance, that initial position is zero, and that final position right there, that's what we're trying to solve for. So over here, um, we can label x initial equals zero meters. And often in this type of problem, we'll define our initial horizontal position as zero, because we usually want to know how far did something go. Um, so most of the time, we just use zero there. Now, before we talk about acceleration, I want to draw a free body diagram for this projectile. Not, not while the cannon's launching it. So I'm not talking about the blast from the cannon. I'm talking about after it leaves the cannon, what are the forces acting on it? In this case, there's only one force, and that's the force of gravity. 
pulling it downward. Now, in reality, there's going to be some drag. But a lot of times we simplify these problems to neglect drag. So it depends on what you're analyzing. A cannonball flying through the air, the drag is going to be pretty small compared to the, you know, the, this mass, uh, heavy, 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 massive cannonball. Um, if we were doing a paper airplane or we were building a rocket ship that's going to move very fast or an airplane that uses lift um, you know, from the drag, well, then we're going to want to incorporate drag. But for this, we're going to neglect drag and say the only force is act acting on it is gravity. Now, what does that mean? Well, horizontally, there's no forces, right? And therefore, horizontally, the forces are balanced. Side to side, the forces are balanced. If we've got balanced forces horizontally, that means our net force horizontally is zero. And if our net force horizontally is zero, then our acceleration has to be, you guessed it, zero. Um, and that means that our velocity horizontally is constant. It's moving horizontally at the same speed the whole time. Vertically, that's not the case. Because vertically, we have an unbalanced force. There's no force to balance out gravity. So we do have an acceleration. Now, luckily, we do know what that acceleration is. As long as we're here on Earth, and I'm assuming this problem is on Earth and not on the moon or some other planet or some place where the gravity uh, acceleration is different, then our acceleration is going to be negative 9.8 meters per second every second. So we have all of the variables we need right here in order to kind of get started on this problem. One of the hardest things in these problems is just filling out what are all of these variables um, up here. So what we want to do now is we want to solve for the time. As soon as you have enough info, solving for the flight time, the amount of time that the projectile is in the air, is the best way to go. And more often than not, we'll use the vertical. There's a few cases where we might use horizontal for this, but normally we'll use the vertical to solve for this flight time. So we're going to write out the position equation, um, which we learned in a previous unit. And this looks slightly different. The only change is I use y instead of x because um, we're looking at vertical. So the vertical position equals initial vertical position plus initial velocity times time plus 1 half at squared. And so we're just going to substitute in the variables that we know at this point. So y equals um, our initial height is 80. Um, this just becomes 0 because our initial velocity vertically is 0. Again, we're just using these vertical variables. We're not doing anything with this horizontal right now. Um, plus 1 half at squared, our acceleration being negative 9.8 um, times t squared. So here we have our equation now. We've got two variables right here. Now I'm going to show you two ways to, to solve for the time here. One, I'm going to do algebraically. And then two, I'm going to do it graphically. This problem, algebraically, is going to be the quickest way. But we'll see later on in a problem where we've got a projectile launched at an angle. That the graphical method, I think, will be quicker for us, and we can find out more information, like the maximum height of the projectile and things like that. So I'm going to show you graphically as well. All right, so let's do this. What we want to know is, what's the flight time? In other words, how much time passes before this projectile reaches the ground? The ground is a height of y equals 0. So we're going to substitute in 0 for y and solve for the time. We're substituting 0 in for y because we want to know when does that projectile hit the ground, which is a height of 0. So let's substitute 0 in for y. I did that here. And half times negative 9 point is negative 4.9 t squared. And I'm going to solve for t squared. I'm going to subtract 80 from both sides and get this. Then I'm going to divide by negative 4.9 on each side. And I get this. And then I'm going to take the square root of both sides, and then I get time equals 4.04 .04 seconds. Technically, t would equal positive or negative 4.04, .04, but we're wanting to know what's happening in the future after this is initially launched. So we're looking at the positive time there. So that's our flight time, 4.04 .04 seconds. So the next thing I want to do, oh, and that's my answer there. The next thing I want to show you is, well, what if... What if we didn't have an initial velocity of zero? In other words, it was launched at an angle, and suddenly we've got this kind of complicated quadratic that we could use the quadratic formula for, but I don't personally love the quadratic using the quadratic formula. I'd rather do it graphically. So I'm going to show you how to do it graphically real quick. So let's jump over to Desmos and check it out there. So here we are in Desmos, and let's go ahead and type in our equation here. y equals 80 plus 1 half times negative 9.8 times t 
squared. Now you don't have to use Desmos, you can use your graphing calculator, you can use some other graphing app, but I prefer Desmos. Desmos does understand X and T as the horizontal variable, so I just left mine in terms of T here. Now whenever we type that in, we're going to get this graph that it doesn't really have a lot of meaning for us yet. It's hard to kind of understand what's really going on here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out and take a look at this kind of full parabola here. Um, now as far as the horizontal axis, that's time, right? That's our x variable, horizontal variable. And we only want to look in the future time. So let's go ahead and adjust our axes and this will make a little bit more sense to us. Let's go from a time of zero to a time of, it looks like it's somewhere before about five there. So let's go from zero to five. And okay, that's a nice looking graph there. Take a look at this. We've got a couple points here. Let's look at this top point first. It says zero comma 80. Our horizontal axis is time. Our vertical axis is, is height. So what this means is that a time of zero seconds, we had a height of 80. And that's true in the problem, right? This launch started from a height of 80. So when the time was zero, it was at a height of 80. Now we can follow this line over to where it crosses the horizontal axis. And here we get 4.04 comma zero. And that means that time equals 4.04 seconds. So after 4.04 seconds have passed, the projectile has a height of zero. And that matches the flight time that we solved for. And so that would be our flight time, how you would find that graphically. Now in this problem, either way was pretty quick. But um, whenever you have a horizontal or a diagonally launched projectile, um, solving for that flight time is a little bit trickier algebraically. You have to use the quadratic formula um, to do it. Um, and this graphically will tell us what our maximum height is. Our maximum height here was 80, but if this were launched diagonally, our maximum height would be somewhere up here. And we could just click on the parabola to find its vertex, and that would be the maximum height. So I highly recommend this method. Um, it's kind of my preferred method for solving these problems. Let's go ahead and finish the rest of this problem out. The only other thing that we need to find is how far from the base of the building will the ball land measured along the ground. So we're trying to find this horizontal distance here. So we're going to do kind of the same thing we did with vertical, but we're going to jump over and use our horizontal variables. We're not going to use any of these other variables ever again, except for the time. The flight time's the same whether we're looking at vertical motion or horizontal motion. It's really the one variable that ties the two sides together. So often we might use the vertical to find time and then we jump over to the horizontal and analyze that. Or in more rare circumstances, we might use the horizontal to find flight time and then jump back over to the vertical. Usually they'll look for the flight time and the vertical here. We usually know a little more information there. So let's look at the horizontal motion then. So I'm just going to write out our position equation again. It's exactly the same as vertical. I'm just using x instead of y, um, but it's really the same equation. We know that the initial position is zero meters, so this first term becomes zero. And our acceleration is zero meters per second per second. And zero times one half times t squared is going to be zero. So our equation simplifies down to just position equals initial velocity times time. And we know both of those variables, 31 meters per second and 4.04 seconds. Time is the only variable that will use the same for both vertical and horizontal. The flight time's the same whether you're looking at its vertical motion or its horizontal motion. When it hits, that's when it hits. That's the, the flight time. So we get our final position is 125 meters. That's our answer to question number four right there. That's also our um, question mark that we wrote down here, that distance from the base to wherever it hits. And that's our final answer. So that's how you do a horizontally launched projectile problem. In the next video, we'll look at a diagonal launch. And we'll see that it's very, very similar. There's an extra trig step we'll do at the beginning. But the rest of the steps we follow are pretty much the same. All right. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.